everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk World Talk Show presented to you by Clickaway Creator. Today we have Mr. Josh Straub, who is a partner at Margie Straub Construction Law LLP, a firm that he started in September 2020 with his partner John Margie. Prior to co-founding Margie Straub Construction Law, Josh managed the nationwide legal affairs for Canada's largest full-service track and signal construction and maintenance provider. There, he focused on the pursuit, execution, and claim phases of some of Canada's highest profile transit infrastructure projects. Josh also gained an acute understanding of the structure, principle, value, and potential pitfalls of collaborative contracting gained from his involvement in Canada's first alliance contract. He's a frequent speaker at industry functions and conferences, including most recently at the 2019 Construction Super Conference in LA, where his panel discussed different forensic schedule analysis methodologies. Additionally, in 2019, Josh co-founded and taught the construction law course at Western Law in London, Ontario. Hello, Josh, how are you? I'm good, thanks for having me, Barty, and thanks for the great introduction. My pleasure. So uh, before uh, we uh, dive a bit deeper, uh, please brief us about your journey as a legal professional so far. Sure, thanks. I'll, I'll start sort of back in, in high school. Uh, I, I kind of always knew that law was a field that I would probably go into. I was one of those kids that liked to argue, which is probably consistent amongst many lawyers. Um, and uh, I had a very good relationship, still have a very good relationship with my grandfather, who was a, a lawyer, and, and he sort of encouraged me in that direction. But then when I was in high school, I, I read the, the Fountainhead, the Ayn Rand book, or as others refer to her, Ayn Rand, but properly pronounced Ayn Rand. Um, and I kind of fell in love with architecture. Um, having been a, uh, a student who always excelled in math and science, I actually had finished my grade 10 math in grade seven. Um, I later, after falling in love with architecture, learned that civil engineering was sort of the science uh, behind architecture, behind buildings and, and construction. And so I started pursuing the concept of, of going to engineering school. And I went to Western University uh, with the plan of studying engineering and law together. They have a combined degree program that's available, although not widely attended. And so I entered into engineering school with the plan that I would apply and get in, hopefully get into that combined degree program, which I fortunately was able to do. And then in my first year of law school, I, I fortunately did well in my first semester. So I had the opportunity to try and, and get a student job for my 1L summer uh, in Toronto. And, and I was looking into who are the best construction lawyers in Canada. I want to you know, pursue the construction field. And I came across Duncan Glayholtz and, and his firm Glayholtz LLP, which is now Glayholtz Bulls LLP. And I just cold called them and I said, look, uh, I'm interviewing with a couple of firms. Uh, I have this background, I'm in this combined degree program. Would you be interested in, in interviewing me? And fortunately they were, they gave me the opportunity and I, I worked there in my summers as an articling student. Um, and then ultimately as a lawyer for a few years until a client of mine gave me the opportunity to move in-house. And, and that's uh, I, when I, I jumped on that opportunity for various reasons, um, including wanting to get some experience on the business side of the world and, and seeing how decisions are made and, and how the business is operated. And so I went in-house with PNR Railworks Inc., which is the Canadian subsidiary of Railworks Corporation, uh, a Canadian and U.S. contractor and maintenance provider in the railway and transit space. I was there for a number of years and it was a fantastic experience. It's a great company. Um, I, I miss all the people I worked with there. Great company, great people. They do lots of great work. And uh, I left just because I wanted to be a little bit more of an entrepreneur. Uh, to, to work for myself, to build a bit of a business for myself and and see where that would go. And also I missed a little bit of the excitement that I had in, in private practice. Different excitement in-house, but um, I missed a little bit of that. And so I had the opportunity to consider going back into private practice. And uh, ultimately I uh, was, was asked by John Margie, my partner, if I was interested in starting a firm with him and for various reasons, jumped on that opportunity. And, quite happy with that decision so far. 
wow you made me uh, miss my uh, first organization so really i mean uh, i'm i'm really impressed with uh, your overall journey so far uh, tell us about your most memorable case and what are your key takeaways from there i'm sure them great so yeah so i don't know if it's necessarily my most memorable case but relative recent experience and you actually already mentioned in my introduction um the canada's first alliance contract and i was involved in the procurement phase of of that contract uh the the team that i was involved with and this was while in house last year uh in 2020 and 2019 uh the team that i was involved with ultimately didn't go forward to be successful there but i was involved for a very long time in the procurement phase reviewing all the different contract documents and really familiarizing myself and the team um both legal and business team from all the different parties that were involved in our proposed alliance with alliance structures and collaborative contracting. I was very fortunate that the team also retained the uh expertise of of two uh individuals based in uh in the UK and elsewhere that have a lot of collaborative contracting experience. So one of the consulting firms is called JCPII based in the UK and it was a fantastic experience to learn from from some of the people that really have built up the collaborative contracting world and the reason i wanted to use that as sort of my example here is that um it's it's a new method of construction contracting and it really turns the traditional construction contracting method on its head construction is is kind of an adversarial um contracting model you partner with your construction partner but you're always at uh at heads with each other you have different interest everyone's trying to protect their own bottom line and so it's a question of who's going to bear what risk and do you agree on who's going to bear the risk and then actually managing that process whereas in the alliance concept which is very similar to IPD integrated project delivery models which is a more commonly understood term in the US um it in that approach it says let's get rid of the adversarial structure here in fact let's put a provision into our contract that says we will not litigate with one another and instead we're all going to work together as a collaborative team and our obligations are all to do everything we can possible and make all decisions in the best interest of the project not in the best interest of our individual companies and once you change it's very it's very hard to grasp but once you change the concept and the approach you start seeing where the efficiencies are and so now you you actually fill roles on the project based on who's the best person to be in that role and so it may be that the owner has an individual who's very good at procurement and so you actually have the owner's individual sit in the procurement lead role on the project which of course is very different than uh a typical construction project where the owner is not going to procure materials on behalf of the contractor unless their owner supplied materials um and it's a it's a very interesting approach it's been very successful elsewhere in the world in Australia and New Zealand and the UK which is why it's now being tested here in Canada but what i learned about it and why one of the other reasons i really wanted to talk about it is that the concept is great but it has to be structured properly and what we found was that the the concepts of the alliance had been uh hacked away at a little bit in the language of the contract and that resulted in a situation where at least in our opinion we were kind of getting the the negatives of both worlds to some extent and therefore you had this no litigation approach and non-adversarial approach yet there was still concepts of the traditional construction project structure in there that didn't fit with that model and that was a deviation from what what we've seen in in the contract language in the UK and in Australia which fortunately we learned from those uh partners that we had with great expertise um and so what i learned is that you know the concept is great but we have to make sure that those uh that those provisions actually implement the concepts behind the alliance and so uh one of the things that i am hoping to do in my new firm is is really help drive forward more and more alliancing in Canada because I do believe that it is a fantastic concept 
Um, and I think that if the parties are given the right counsel and draft the contracts appropriately, get into the appropriate mindset, that it can be a very, very successful and mutually beneficial approach to construction contracting. All right, that was uh, quite an insight. Uh, also, uh, my third question is somewhat related to what you have just explained, but uh, for our audience, uh, I would like to ask that again so that it, you know, it is more clear for them. Uh, what was your uh, main objective or, uh, okay, objective might be a wrong word here, but what was your vision when you set up your own firm? Sure. So, I mean, fundamentally, I, I want to provide an unparalleled level of service to clients, leveraging my in, in-house experience, my engineering experience, and my partner, John Margie's extensive construction law experience. My partner, John, is a certified specialist in construction law from the Law Society of Ontario. He's a Lexpert ranked lawyer. He's a Best Lawyers ranked lawyer. He's a fellow of the Canadian College of Construction Lawyers. So he has a lot of fantastic experience and fantastic knowledge that coupled with my perhaps less years of experience, um, but different uh, background in, in my technical background in engineering and my um, in-house experience, I think that we can really be great partners to our clients. And, and so far we have been. And in doing so, we're, we're providing legal advice and legal services, but really from a business oriented framework. And so always keeping in mind um, the business aspects. And, and so what we are doing and, and part of our vision is to go above and beyond the strict legal advice all the time, but rather provide more practical business oriented solutions. You know, it's interesting because lawyers are basically trained to be pessimists. We're trained to identify risks and issues and avoid those risks and also to stay within our area of expertise. Well, oh, that's not a legal issue. Okay, I, I'm just going to stay silent on that one. I'll defer to somebody else or defer to the business. But business and successful business is about taking risk. That's where people make money when they accept risk in, in a place that somebody else is not willing to accept that risk. And so it's that world that people are creating value, the risk-taking world. So what we are trying to do is, is really help supporting our clients to identify and be aware of those risks so that they know the risks that they're taking and appropriately protecting against them. Now, sometimes that protection is in the contract or in the legal advice that we're providing, uh, but sometimes they're practical solutions or practical mitigation opportunities that can be done to avoid having to change the structure of the contract and get rid of the risk. And, and you know, really what it comes down to is the best legal advice is often in contrast with reality or with efficiency. So as an example, you know, I can write up a contract for my client that minim minimizes all their risk and it's the best contract in the world. They're going to make lots of money. They're not going to lose any money. They're going to have that margin protected. Maybe they'll increase their margin. Um, but is that contract going to be accepted by their customers? Probably not. Maybe some of them will, but is it going to result in a uh, prolonged negotiation every time they want their contract signed and they're going to have to hire a lawyer every time to negotiate that contract and spend a lot of money? The, we, you know, we, have to, we have to be balancing those different concerns and pros and cons all the time. And, and that's one of the things that, that, we are, that we are doing here at my firm. And then the last thing um, that is really an important part of our vision is recognizing that in large scale infrastructure projects or large scale construction projects generally, the prime contractor, the general contractor is often a highly sophisticated organization with project lawyers or perhaps um, a lawyer that is fully dedicated or, or almost fully dedicated to the project. And so they're available to the project on a day-to-day -day basis to address issues that arise. And the smaller subcontractors who in many cases aren't small, they could be very large organizations. They're just playing at a lower level in the construction pyramid. Um, they don't have that project level support. And the result I find is that the protection that they do have in the contract they often lose because they're not recognizing the need to respond or to exercise those rights, or they're not doing it in a timely fashion. And so one of our visions is to really be that resource to those smaller 
uh, companies, or again, not smaller companies, but playing at a, a lower level in the construction pyramid, and therefore essentially have an equal playing field when it comes to legal and contractual administration issues on a project. Wow. <laughs> it left me speechless, uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it would be great if you can also, because there are many people who are watching this interview. So what advice would you give someone uh, who is, you know, just about to start as a legal professional or maybe, you know, they're planning to start their own firm? So what advice would you give them? Keep an open mind. Always think and challenge. Uh, you know, the legal profession is, is a little bit odd because in law school, we're taught how to think like a lawyer and think about legal issues, but we aren't taught any practical skills. There's a lot of uproar in the legal industry about that and people talking about maybe we should change the law school model, maybe we should shorten law school, etc. cetera. Um, and then you go into legal practice and you're taught a bunch of skills, but you're actually largely encouraged not to think for yourself. You're encouraged to do what you're told by the senior lawyers or to follow the process that the firm has established. And then at some undefined point in time, a switch is supposed to flick and all of a sudden you're supposed to think for yourself because you're gonna become a partner. And I mean, every firm is gonna be a little bit different, but it, it's very odd that here you are being taught how to think, then you're being taught essentially not to think, just do what you're told because you're a junior and you just do what the senior guy tells you to do. Um, and then all of a sudden someone expects you to start thinking again, but you're not really told when. Um, so I guess, you know, my advice is, of course, you need to be mindful of your surroundings, your firm culture, expectations, et cetera. You don't want to burn bridges, but don't ever stop thinking for yourself and don't ever stop challenging. Um, and, you know, you have to figure out the tactful way of doing so and the appropriate way of bringing those issues up to your superiors or your, your colleagues. But don't ever fall in the mindset that you're just a doer. You as a lawyer are supposed to be a thinker, not just a doer. Of course, we have to do as well. Um, beyond that, I'd say, you know, find a good working environment. You want to find a, a, a good law firm where the people that you work with don't view the world in terms of seniority, but they view the world more in terms of merit. If you can find that kind of role, then I think you'll thrive. Um, our legal industry remains a little bit backwards, but is starting to uh, change with the times in that we look at the world from a seniority perspective. This guy's been practicing for 30 years, so he gets to charge the high rate, and this guy's been practicing for five years, so he doesn't. Well, the guy practicing for five years might be smarter, more efficient, and all around better than the guy that's been practicing for 30 years, but that's just how our uh, industry is currently structured. Again, starting to move away. Fortunately, the the young tech CEOs have started to make the world realize that uh, you don't have to be old with gray hair to, to provide the best service. Um, so if you can find a, a firm where the senior partners believe in merit more so than seniority, then you're going to thrive. And I was very fortunate that that's how Duncan Glayholt views the world. And so right from the start, when I was a first year law student in the summer, he was all open to me challenging his his ideas and to accepting my suggestions. And then the last thing I would say is uh, I'm a strong believer in the concept that happiness is a mindset. Um, we humans are oddly able to control our happiness. And it's unlikely that you're, that anyone's ever going to find a job or a role where you're excited about everything you do every day. Um, you're, every task you do is not going to be interesting. Um, a lot of what we do, not just lawyers, but everybody in the world is boring. Um, we do some interesting things, some exciting things, hopefully more so than the boring things. But the reality is we live in a world where, we, uh, where we're often doing things that we don't necessarily love doing. And it's very easy for us to sort of flick a switch in our mind that we're unhappy about it or the grass is greener on the other side. You know, everyone always says the grass is greener on the other side. And you have to be very careful not to let yourself do that, especially in the legal industry where you're billing hours and hours and sitting at your desk and working all the time. You have to keep that positive mindset because once you, you switch it off, it's hard to go back. Um, and I, I've seen that, um, I would say a little bit in myself, but certainly I've seen that in people. And often when people leave jobs, you know, they, something happens, 
the, the switch flicked in their mind and all of a sudden they were the happy employee and now they're, they're off looking for a new job. So um, I, I'd say, you know, be very mindful of your happiness and, and try and keep a positive outlook because it, it really does make a difference. Um, and we do have a lot more control over that happiness than people like to think. I guess you have given me a lot of uh, takeaways. I mean, I, I don't know. Happiness is a mindset and uh, keep always keep an open mind. And oh my God, there's so many things that I have learned from you today. That is just amazing. So uh, coming down to the last question, how do you look at construction law in 2021? And uh, how do you think it's going to change uh, five years down the line? So it's a good question and, and actually quite timely for 2019 through 2021, I guess, particularly in Ontario, because the Construction Act was modified. And there's now a regime called prompt payment and adjudication. I won't get into the details of it. But over this year and the next five years, we're going to start seeing a lot of uh, development in how that new law is applied and learning from the experiences of that new legislation. So I think there's really going to be a focus on how, it, how it's working. Is it working properly? And where do the courts need to develop the, the law beyond what it says in the legislation to, to give appropriate uh, efficacy to what was drafted? Outside of Ontario, I think we're going to see something very similar. Most other provinces are looking at implementing similar changes to their construction laws. Um, and so I think the next few years, we're going to see how those different legislative bodies take the Ontario experience and either copy it or tweak it. Um, and then similarly, once it is implemented, how their experience uh, develops over time. I think alliancing and IPD, which I talked about before, which fall into the collaborative contracting uh, sort of category. We're, we're collaborating rather than being adversarial. I think that those are gonna really come out strong over the next five years. It's already happening. IPD is becoming more and more prevalent in the US. Um, alliancing is quite prevalent in the, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand. And as we can see, it's coming to Canada. And I hope to be part of that wave of helping bring the collaborative model into Canada along with my uh, now partners in, in the UK at JCPII. Um, and, and then lastly, technology. I mean, I'm sure everyone answers that same question, technology, right? Um, but like, like every other industry, tech is evolving rapidly um, and it's changing the construction landscape. And we lawyers who are a bit archaic need to learn to adapt. Um, so for example, there's a, a company or a platform called Procore. It's a really well thought through uh, platform for construction manager, management. I was fortunate that I was part of the, the research and rollout process for using that platform at my company. And so I got to learn a lot about its pros and cons. And I think uh, I have no uh, relationship with the company, but I think they've done a fantastic job of, of developing their technology. And it allows parties to uh, collaborate and to manage much of the, the paperwork, which is no longer in our world paper, um, on a construction project in this integrated platform. And so it's really a shift to what we lawyers are used to. And so we need to you know, learn how to not just understand the law, but how do these platforms work? How do the parties interact with those platforms? How should they be interacting with them? What data exists in there and how can it be extracted in what formats and how can we use it? How's that gonna impact the documentary discovery process and litigation? Um, and that's just you know, the, the construction tech that we need to adapt to as lawyers. There's of course all the legal tech that continues to, uh, to populate in, in the marketplace. And um, it's certainly gonna have an impact. You're gonna see uh, a lot more work from home that's already happening, of course, and hopefully that will help contribute to lawyers' happiness. Um, but yeah, tech will continue to challenge us and continue to change the landscape. And we gotta be nimble and, and be willing and able to adapt. I mean, Josh, uh, this is by far, I mean, uh you know, the most engaging interview that uh, I, I have had, I mean, personally. And wow, thank it, you. It, it was really lovely knowing you uh, as a person, what your vision is, uh, 
I don't know. I mean, it was just amazing. So thank you so much for sharing such great insights with us. Uh, we really look forward to having a chat with you again in future on maybe some other trending topics from the international legal industry. And for our viewers, if you like this chat with Josh, please like and share this video and also subscribe to Click of Your Creators YouTube channel to appreciate what we do. And you also have more coming from industry leaders. This is Bharti for Lex Talk. Take care. Bye-bye.